В зале у нас Software Architecture поток, и сам поток подразумевает два формата. Это презентации, доклады по 45 минут и мастер-классы час 45. После презентации вам будет предоставлено время, просьба задавать вопросы в микрофон, потому что идет запись. С этим вам помогут наши волонтеры. Хочу обратить внимание на наших партнеров. Подходите, пожалуйста, к стендам, регистрируйтесь, участвуйте, выигрывайте в конкурсах. Завтра будет розыгрыш подарков от наших партнеров и скидка на курс Kubernetes Do It Yourself. Курс, пожалуйста, присутствуйте на закрытии. Будет розыгрыш. Что ж, будем начинать. Разрешите мне представить Анджела Корсаро. Он CTO in Adlix uh, Technologies. Uh, he is an Italian, uh, but uh, living in France. And uh, he's a world top expert in edge computing. And uh, uh, we were joking that it, it was foggy this morning, wasn't it? And uh, the topic of the first speech uh, is, is about uh, fog computing. Uh, actually, I'd like to know what it is and um, most more important what it isn't, why do we need it, and uh, just tell us, uh, explain what is FOG05. <laughs> Introduce us, please. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, I will try and then you'll tell me, but please, uh, so just to make sure that uh, my chances of succeeding, if I'm not clear or if there is anything for which you have a question or a doubt, raise your hand immediately, so let's try to keep this as, uh, uh, let's say, interactive as, as possible, because I think that, uh, that would be far more fun. Okay, so I'm glad to hear that it was foggy, but there is sun, so that's beautiful because in Paris it's raining. So the summer was long, but uh, it's already you know, a lonely remembering from, uh, from sufficiently far away, but well, that's, that's how it is. But it's quite tough for me because I'm really from the south of Italy, from Sicily, in fact, where there's always sun and yeah, seldom rains. But anyway, that's life. Um, okay, so um, I already gave some context in my previous presentation um, and we will try to go a little bit deeper. So as I was um, mentioning before, I really come from uh, <clears throat> a background in distributed system. Uh, I've been in distributed system for forever and um, most of the time uh, this distributed system that have some mission critical requirements. So for instance, just uh, you know, to, to give you <laughs> some credibility points. If today you fly over France, Italy, Switzerland, or any other country that has a, um, uh, an ATC or ATM center that was uh, deployed by either Thales or uh, Leonardo, okay, uh, then you're using some software that I architected and wrote uh, probably 15 years ago. And that's mission critical distributed software uh, that is indeed real time. And by the way, she was mentioning about real time. I was shocked when I arrived there because um, uh, we had real time constraint. Uh, and you know, real time doesn't mean real fast as we were discussing before, but it means predictable. But still, back then, uh, we were supposed to address the real time needs by properly dimensioning and throughput. But uh, you know, the scale is, is huge, especially if you look at a single sky, there is now interoperability across the entire Europe. And uh, some of the critical components that we developed were precisely to distribute flight data plan and ensure, theoretically, because today technologically is possible, that the controller sitting in uh, Kiev okay, could potentially um, manage a flight that was flying over Spain. Technically, it's possible today. Um, I don't know if you follow the, the news in the traffic control management, there were strikes already two years ago in France to make this not possible from a regulatory perspective. Okay, because you understand that uh, if uh, anybody allows another country to manage its airspace, all of a sudden the controller lose all their power. And, um, and so a, a job position that is quite fundamental they strike, fine, we let uh, you know, somebody, God's nowhere in Europe, deal with your air traffic, airspace. On the other hand, there are some countries like Austria. Austria, I don't know if you know, doesn't manage its uh, airspace. It's managed by Italy. Did you know that? So in Austria, yes, there are the radars, but the controllers managing the airspace are Italian. And you can imagine the scale of the distributed system and the amount of data and the criticality of the data that is flying. So that's one of the systems that, uh, that actually I built uh, early in the early 2000s, okay? 
just to give you some context. So um, let's uh, go now to the present. Let's try to focus on uh, you know, one of the hot topics that has to do with uh, the emerging Internet of Things or Internet of Everything, as Cisco li likes to call it. Um, and by the way, even in that uh, domain, I like to make a distinction between the consumer Internet of Things and the industrial Internet of Things. As an instance, if you consider you know, your Fitbit, your connected uh, personal devices, um, typically we classify those as the consumer Internet of Things. Why? Uh, well, first of all, because they are not mission critical. Okay? Usually, if, you're, if you lose the connectivity to, to the cloud, uh, in any case, your, 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 uh, your Fitbit is connected by Bluetooth to your mobile. But let's say if you lose connectivity and for some times you are not able to update uh, uh, your statistics, it's nobody really care. I mean, you might get a little bit upset, but it's okay. If the cloud fails, and again, you cannot look uh, your, uh, some of the statistics on how much uh, calorie you burn, it's okay. I mean, nobody's going to, to complain too much, okay? Uh, on the other hand, if you look at industrial internet application, those are applications like smart grids, connected vehicles, uh, connected medical devices, in which um, the application typically uh, is not directly, inter not necessarily directly interacting with the user, like your watch, uh, or not necessarily for some personal uh, aspect. And more importantly, there are inherently some uh, mission, there is inherently some mission criticality in the in the application domain. So if you think about connected um, uh, tractors, by the way, uh, or autonomous tractors. By the way, this is not science fiction. Uh, if you know John Deere, uh, yeah? So John Deere, uh, they already have autonomous tractors. Any of you knew about this? They've had autonomous tractors for, I think, since uh, 2000, should be th since probably, we are 2019, I, probably since 2015 or something like that. And um, the software used for the autonomous tractor uh, to communicate and coordinate between the autonomous tractor, we did it, okay? So we did it with John Deere. And that's one example in which uh, uh, you have to be very careful because uh, uh, these tractors, actually they are harvesters and combiner, they coordinate and they address the, uh, essentially the, the, the problem of gathering perhaps uh, uh, you know, corn or something else in a field as an embarrassing parallel problem because if you think about it, you can divide the field as you want, and then you have literally harvester that draw like, like this, okay, like little snakes. And um, uh, from time to time, the combiners, because you have less combiners than harvester, have to get close to an harvester, and when I mean close, it's like 30 centimeters away, and driving 30 miles per hour <laughs> following these shapes, and they're autonomous, okay? So you realize that uh, the application is mission critical because if the two smash on top of each other, you get in big trouble because you use lots of value. Same things with uh, uh, robots in a factory or perhaps car in, uh, in automation. So for this class of application, as we will see, uh, the, arch the, the architecture that are adopted in consumer um, Internet of Things don't just apply. But let's, let's get there. So the first things that I want to do is to analyze from, uh, let's say, a high-level perspective, although I'll explain that there is some fallacy in this division, okay, but let's try to start somewhere, the tiers that you have in a traditional IoT or MEC, where MEC stands for um, multi-access edge computing. A anybody has heard this term before? Otherwise, I'll briefly explain what it means because I'll, uh, I'll keep it using from time to time. Okay, 5G, I'm pretty sure that you have heard, okay? So some of the goal of 5G are a reduced latency, so it's latency of one millisecond, so that they've made quite a bit of press around it. It is increased uh, density. So I don't know if you know, but one of the objective is um, uh, 10,000 people, uh, or um, I can't recall which is the surface, but it's an improvement 100x compared to the previous generation. Um, and uh, to achieve some of this goal, okay, obviously for density, you have the concept of micro, nano, and femtocell. But then for latency, one of the uh, challenges they have today is that typically, uh, when you need to communicate with between uh, you know, two um, 5G or 4G terminals today, your communication goes higher up on the network, network infrastructure, almost up to their data center, only to go down. So there was a basic idea in which in order to support 
both low latency as well as try to recover the over the top business. What is over the top business? Over the top business is Netflix, okay? Is anything that has to do with media um, and anything that typically requires some form of either content distribution or content caching as close as possible uh, to the consumer. So the basic idea was that they would um, um, want to expand their, their infrastructure to ensure that uh, they had uh, computing as close as possible to the, term, the user terminal. And so MEC, when I will uh, quote MEC server, MEC server are uh, compute storage and communication node uh, that are as close as possible uh, to you, so typically deployed on an antenna, um, and uh, the other big difference for, for 5G is that those computational resources will be available to users, not just to the telco. Okay, so when 5G will be, uh, will be available, and this is one, also one of the reasons why, why they say that 5G is not just a network for users, it's a network for enterprises. Because suppose you want to start competing with a content uh, uh, caching uh, solution that is available there. And typically this content caching provider uh, will have their own server deployed across the globe. Suppose you want to do that on Ukraine. And you have a telco provider that already has 5G infrastructure. Without, without any capex, okay, you would be able to use the telco infrastructure, and in fact they, their MEC server, uh, to do that. And they will have to make available for you as well some provisioning infrastructure. So that's, that's what it is, an MEC server, and that's what MEC um, is about. Okay, so going back here, if you look at the tiers that you have typically in uh, industrial IoT, in some consumer IoT, and in MEC systems, so read 5G, so you have some cloud, you have some edge infrastructure, okay, and then you have the things. And what the things are depends, once again, on your target application. Could be consumer devices, could be cars, could be robots, could be whatever, okay, fine. Now, obviously, we have compute storage and communication capabilities everywhere with different degrees, right, of, uh, and different, uh, let's say, power, but uh, those are available everywhere. And I think from um, an energetic perspective, if we care about the environment, and I do care, uh, we should try to leverage them uh, in, the, in the optimal manner. Okay, so if we look at the different architecture that are proposed today for, let's say, either IoT, and uh, when I will say IoT, I mean both consumer as well as industrial, or 5G slash MEC, okay? Uh, typically, they surround on uh, uh, putting bias or avoiding, let's say, bias on some of these tiers, okay? So if we start with the architectural um, style that is the most uh, uh, well uh, no, uh, known and the most popular today, especially in consumer Internet of Things, which is in any case the manifestation of the Internet of Things that all of you have already in one way or another witnessed and uh, experienced, then they have adopted the cloud-centric infrastructure. There are several reasons why this happened, uh, one of which is, as we'll see, convenience. So cloud infrastructure was there. Um, many of the companies that entered the consumer IoT market were startup that didn't want to do any kind of CapEx infrastructure. The infrastructure already provided them a global access um, or you know, with, with decent performance. So this was, um, you know, was quite good and um, you know, a, a good choice for many consumer applications. And as you can, uh, as you very well know, the basic idea is that you treat the things, so the device, uh, that make your application as relatively dumb, and all the computing happens in the cloud. So usually you push data to the cloud, the cloud runs the analytics, that does the storage, does all the important things, and eventually pushes control or data back to the, uh, to the devices. So once again, there is a large class of consumer IoT application that uh, you know, can work very, very well with this, with this architectural pattern. And the technological ecosystem is very mature, is very productive. So if you can use it, very good. But there are some challenges. So these challenges very often emerge in the system that I find more interesting because they are a little bit more challenging from a technical perspective. And let's try to understand what they are. So the ability of leveraging cloud-centric architecture is built on five assumptions. And if you, at least five assumptions, but those are the, the key five assumptions. And if you break at least one of those, then uh, you know, the, the ability or the feasibility or the effectiveness of using a cloud-centric architecture kind of fall apart. So what is the first assumption? 
The first assumption is that you have sufficient bandwidth to push data to the cloud, okay? You will say, hey, you just mentioned about 5G. Yes, but, uh, so we work, for instance, in the energy domain. And uh, energy uh, center or a, 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 an installation of uh, a factory that produces energy, a few years ago used to produce 0.5 terabytes of data per day. With additional digitalization, uh, that number is only growing. And you probably recall the quote from uh, Amazon CTO that is never underestimate the bandwidth of a wagon, right? Because sometimes they ask people to send them tapes. So if you want to do anything in real time with this amount of data, I mean, doesn't, pushing it to a cloud doesn't feel like the best idea. And very often it's not feasible uh, from, uh, uh, from a connectivity perspective. Then there is another assumption. If you're using cloud-centric architecture as your brain resides on the cloud, you're assuming that inherently you have, you're either you're always connected or you are sufficiently connected, okay? So let's say connected most of the time. But once again, I, I mean, today the world has become small and so everyone travels and you know that uh, there are lots of areas in which you have no connectivity, okay? Or very poor, con for sure you don't have uh, 4G and you will not necessarily have 5G. Uh, so this assumption might be true on cities, main cities, but it's not true on rural area. Once again, for certain application, uh, you cannot assume that uh, you will not be deployed on rural area. So if we go back to the example I gave you before with John Deere, most of the farms in the US, uh, when we did that project, were connected at best with 2G. If they had 3G, they were like very happy, okay? Third assumption. There is inherently an assumption in cloud-centric architecture that the latency required to push the data from your device to the, to the cloud, doing whatever computation has to be done on the cloud, and then pushing the resolution or the result or the control back to the, to the device is good enough, okay? So once again, if it's your Fitbit, fine. If it's an autonomous car or the John Deere use case, not fine. And in fact, here this is the, the example precisely of John Deere. You can't do the collision avoidance of these vehicles on the cloud. There is no way, okay, because uh, um, the latency is not there and you were just introducing a huge risk in any case, okay? So even from a safety engineering perspective, that's really not what you want to do. Fourth point, you assume that the cost of connectivity is negligible. Um, so I, I think this is very counterintuitive for many people because they say, well, hold on, I mean, we pay nearly nothing for our data plan. And actually most of the consumer IoT application leverage the fact that uh, it's you who is paying for connectivity, it's not them. When you use Fitbit, it's not them who pay for sending data to the cloud. They, 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 they just uh, make money or more money selling uh, information on your data to other parties, but it's you who is paying. Okay, uh, if we flip the application and we take as an example smart grids. In smart grids, and here I give you the example of Schneider. Maybe you know Schneider. It's one of the world leader in uh, anything that has to do with electricity. And they do lots of technology for smart grids, one of which dig digitalization. So we work in France with Schneider, and uh, what they told us is say, hey, do you know that uh, to monitor the state of our infrastructure, we still use 2G? He said, really? Because of coverage? They say, no, because of cost. Because we have to pay for the connectivity. And then I'll give you another number, because that's a constraint that they gave us uh, with respect to overhead. And I said, and by the way, today we have innovation blockers, because the way in which they can do telemetry, okay, is by using a protocol that perhaps most of you have not heard. It's called Modbus TCP. How many of you have ever heard about this? <laughs> not surprising. So they are stuck with this protocol, why? Because the wire of, so open, open while you're here, because this is another world, but it's the world I come from. The wire overhead they have is seven bytes. So suppose I'm sending a reading, which I can represent with four bytes, so we, I'm still counting bytes, unfortunately. Um, then they have seven bytes overhead. They won't tolerate anything that is bigger because as they pay by megabytes sent per day, 
uh, you know, doubling that will double their operation cost. I mean, many people don't think about this anymore, but this is the reality in this kind of system. I'll give another example. We work with oil exploration company, and most of the platforms that are uh, in the outer sea, they communicate through satellite. Do you know how much it costs to them to send one megabyte of data over a satellite link? Anybody can guess? No. Come on, a wild guess. <laughs> Try. No, 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 it's not 1,000, it's, okay, it's, it's 8 dollars, but they produce terabyte of data per day. So, but they still have to send some data. So, I, I, we work with them, they literally count the bytes uh, of overhead of protocol used to send data, okay? So, this world, it's tricky, but this is an interesting world um, where we are trying to, be, to bring also the, um, the, the same level of manageability that we have, let's say, in the, in the data center, because that's what, what would greatly simplify, let's say, the, the management. But you have all these nasty constraints with respect to, let's say, efficiency or cost. Um, and sometimes the, the cost drives efficiency, sometimes it's just a physical constraint. Assumption number five. Ah, the picture got on top. There is a G that has been uh, covered by the picture there. The other under, assum underlying assumption is that um, by using a cloud-centric architecture, actually, uh, you're assuming that your customers are comfortable in storing and giving the data to the cloud uh, infrastructure, okay? And uh, uh, although that might be true for personal uh, application, although I think uh, you know, some people underestimate how much business is done on our, uh, on our personal data, which is ridiculous, but in any case, uh, I can assure you that even before Snowden, okay, a company in the OT market would never put any strategic data on the cloud. So I was on a keynote at Fraunhofer Focus with the um, head of platform of Bosch, and they said, there's no way we will use uh, or will ever use uh, um, a public cloud from one of the GAFAM because, I mean, we just don't trust that our data will be, will not, uh, our production data will not be uh, leaked out. And uh, let me pause there for a moment. Often in cloud infrastructure, they tell you, ah, but don't worry, I mean, we have you know, proper virtualization of the network, so the network is secured, uh, and this and that. Are you familiar with the um, microdata attacks at the instruction level? Never heard about this. Okay. So for those of you that are interested, I'll send you the link. But, uh, and again, there is some reflection to make on that as well. So today, it's possible, even from a browser, if you exploit the micro, the micro architectural bug that there are in the Intel processor, and they are on almost all their processor, to steal data from another processor that is running on the same machine, even if it's running on the secure enclave, on the SGX. Did you know that? Do you know who found this bug? Two European, how surprising. Um, and uh, uh, surprisingly, uh, ARM doesn't suffer this problem, uh, but Intel does, okay? So, might be an accident or, or might be not. But today, if you exploit micro-architectural bugs, and uh, for those of you interested, I'll give you the link of the GitHub pages that provides you with the application. To, you can do an attack from, from a browser with JavaScript. Uh, and there is a very interesting paper that came out, uh, uh, I think it was in June, but that, that's, the, the, I think, the coolest from one, one, uh, one hand and the most frightening on the other side. I'll give you the reference of the paper for those of you interested. But tells you once again that, I mean, yeah, sure, virtualization, segregation, yes, but if I really want to steal your data, uh, as a malicious user, I can, okay? And the tools are there to do that. And so if your data is business critical, I can assure you that especially in Europe, as the, the cloud is owned by you know, non-European country, European company don't, don't put that. Okay, so to address some of the challenges that um, um, come with cloud-centric architecture, at some point there was a movement that says, hey, what about uh, trying to you know, move this idea of the cloud and the benefits that the cloud provides in terms of management, operation, elasticity, and so on and so forth, a little bit closer to where the data is produced 
and uh, in some kind of uh, edge infrastructure. So I was mentioning the, in, the, in the previous, um, in, the, in my keynote, the basic idea is that you, you get uh, mini data centers, um, which are still quite powerful, but they are different because already in this world, there is no more, well, Dell is trying to get in, but often it's not even your typical Dell server or HP server because in uh, several different uh, applications, this mini data center run in that environment, perhaps on the open road, and they need to be fanless and IP64. Okay, so it's already a different market. And this is the market, for instance, in which uh, we, we play, okay? So we don't play on the cloud, we start playing on these sort of things downward, down to, to here, with both hardware and software, okay? So already from a technological perspective, you can see that uh, the cost per CPU cycle goes, high, goes up because the, the hardware inherently is better quality because in order to, you have to operate over extended temperature range. Again, it's fanless, which means you have to have uh, um, uh, heat pipes, which raises the cost. Uh, so it's usually more complicated to design better hardware that on the flip side also has to have longer life because uh, if you deploy this uh, um, closer to where the data is produced, you cannot have an assumption that is, um, you know, it fails by, by definition uh, because it's a mess <laughs> operationally to then go and upgrade them. So it's already a slightly different um, set of constraints, but still uh, most of the servers that are there can be on the Xeon class, okay? So we're still talking about infrastructure that is relatively powerful. But I give you an example. I mean, some of the hardware that um, we designed for, for Nokia and that sits in their MEC uh, server, I mean, one server cost uh, with, with one uh, high-end Xeon, okay? Um, fanless and ruggedized cost 10,000 euro, okay? So it's a completely different uh, uh, hardware and a completely different kind of design, okay? Uh, but uh, once again, uh, we have different challenges. But that said, um, in terms of resource, you're still, there are plenty of resources. We are not discussing about a uh, you know, machine with uh, hundreds of kilobytes of, of RAM or flash. Uh, but, but on the other hand, as the cost of computing is higher, well, you want to leverage your hardware well, okay? And for sure, try to limit the amount of resource that you are wasting. So be more effective now you use it, okay? Because I would say that the cost per CPU cycle, it's higher than what you have in the cloud, okay? Okay, now the question is, so I was arguing that uh, this idea of edge computing is a fallacy. And we have had endless debates in this, in this domain. I mean, uh, there is a conference that, um, uh, that is held uh, in January, uh, end of January, every year. The, uh, that is the Edge World Conference. And last year, we got into an endless argument with all the other keynote and then on the panel. Because I was saying, I mean, Edge doesn't make any sense. Uh, and anyway, so it was interesting. So let me try to explain why the idea of Edge is a fallacy. So, Let's take an example at our system we look in a couple of years, okay? So you will have on one end your 5G network in which there is the network core to which typically you don't have access. That's only accessible to the network operator. And then you have the MEC infrastructure that from a telco operator, this is the edge, okay? Because this is, the, this is its administrative boundary. And these are the server that you will be able typically to provision. You will be able potentially to run your application there or to, to, to install your storage solutions so on and so forth. Now let's get onto either Uncle Joe farm or perhaps uh, um, you know, a, um, an automation company, so a factory. From the factory perspective, maybe these are the tractors or the robots or whatever or the manufacturing machines. And this is their edge infrastructure. So where is the edge? And I'm drawing a simplified uh, situation, right? So uh, you realize that this idea of trying to draw a line is a fallacy, okay? Because uh, here is the edge here, is the edge there. In fact, the edge is neither here nor there. I mean, what we should really do is just uh, look at this as a continuum. There are resources that I can use with different characteristics, and I need to be able to provision and manage them um, in a uniform manner. That's really the problem I need to solve. On top of that, if we don't have this form of integration, if I want to leverage the infrastructure end-to-end, -end, 
um, but I have no interoperability in the way in which I can manage the machine here, the machine here, and the computational capability available here. It becomes just a complete mess. Okay, so we need to look at the problem holistically, and that's what Fog Computing tries to do. Okay, uh, let me jump this. So the basic idea of Fog Computing architecture is precisely this. So forget about the segregation. In the end, resources are resources, regardless of where they are. They might be in a cloud, which means they are just a little bit more remote. Uh, they might be you know, in servers that are closer to me, or could be the device itself. But still, those are resources that uh, have certain characteristics with respect to what I can do from a computational, um, uh, from uh, a sto storage, and a communication perspective. Okay, so the basic idea of computing is the following. Don't, don't segregate, unify. That said, by the way, we are not arguing that uh, if you want to use here EC2, you sh so the, the Amazon EC2 infrastructure, you shouldn't be able to do that. What we are arguing is that regardless of what you're using here and what potentially you're using, using here, okay, we want still to provide you an illusion that this is a unified resource pool that you can manage and orchestrate at a higher level and then deal with the details of you know, whether everything is managed by the fog infrastructure or if you're just using uh, something else like EC2 or the Azure or the Google Cloud uh, or here and perhaps Kubernetes, Kubernetes here. But for sure, you cannot have Kubernetes here because it won't, won't fit. Okay, and I'll give you, if we have time, I'll give you some numbers with respect to that. Okay, so to make FOG architecture viable, uh, there are some challenges that we need to solve, okay? Because as I said, uh, this is one of the, of the problems that we need to solve in, in order to really make FOG architecture applicable. And the first problem has to do really with um, uh, data plane. So today, if you look at uh, most of the, let's say, the cloud-centric architect uh, architecture, um, have a pretty primitive data plane. So device communicate typically through HTTP or MQTT to the cloud. Well, that doesn't work in the, in the system I, I, I showed you. Why? Well, because uh, neither of those are sufficiently efficient or support all the communication pattern, pattern we require. And more importantly, in this case, okay, suppose that I have an application and, and a multi-tenant that lies like this. I, not, I need to create a virtual network end-to-end. -end. But actually, in some cases, uh, this application, I, I don't have the collaboration of the, of the network administrator, so how do I do that? Um, some of these applications might be running on low power networks. I cannot do MQTT, yeah, there is, there is MQTT SN, but then all of a sudden it's MQTT SN from here to there, then perhaps HTTP or MQTT, it becomes really a mess. So there is one problem we need to solve, which is you know, a, a protocol, so a connectivity layer, that ideally is data-centric and allow us to cover uh, data connectivity end-to-end. -end. The second problem that we need to address is decentralized or geodistributed storage. Okay, once again, if I'm in this situation and um, uh, you know, I, I cannot afford to store all the data in the cloud, okay? Um, I don't want to duplicate data, so ideally I would want to store data where it makes sense, but at the same time, address and resolve data from anywhere. Okay, so that's the second problem we need to solve. And the third problem, obviously, is that of providing a, uh, an infrastructure that allows us you know, to provision, manage um, the network, the computer, and the storage, as well as the I.O. in this kind of infrastructure. So I gave you already two pointers during the keynote to Zeno and Yax, and you will see that Zeno and Yax, the reason why I gave you the pointer is because they are key building blocks at the bottom of FogOS, and you will see how they are leveraged. Because without Zen and Yax, it would be very, very hard to do FogOS. And it's thanks to Zen and Yax that it becomes a manageable exercise to build FogOS, okay? So, by the way, um, just in terms of time checking, how much more time do I have? Five minutes? I was going very slow. Okay, so I need to accelerate. Okay, so what is FogOS? FogOS is a Fog platform that provides you, or uh, that, uh, that allows you to do provisioning, management of compute storage, communication, and I.O. So once again, for um, industrial IoT, it's essential to be able to manage I.O. We have applications that say, I need 
uh, a GPIO, or I need to be in this pre precise location, uh, or I, don't, I, I need to store data, but data cannot get out of this geofence, okay? So anything that has to do with geographical location, availability of your resources, and for instance, affinity. So something we need to support, just to give you an idea. We have some application in which there are robots, uh, AGV, so autonomous guided vehicle, uh, moving through a factory. And um, uh, regardless of what my friends from the robotics uh, unit would want, uh, the robot is not autonomous. It's, it's piloted by a brain that sits on some uh, uh, edge infrastructure, okay? And as the factory, so for instance, we work with Foxconn. In Foxconn, Foxconn manufactures iPhones. Most of the hardware for testing iPhones we do, by the way. Um, so in Foxconn, you have 30 minutes bus to go from one end to the other end of their factory in, in China. So you can imagine that some of these AGV actually can even drive for kilometers, which means that uh, uh, if you need to control and you want to maintain the control in real time, the brain has to follow the AGV. So we have to do preventing migration and live migration of the, uh, the, the, the logic that is piloting the brain. So all of those constraints just don't exist on the typical cloud infrastructure. Very interesting problem to solve that are completely inexistent and non addressed by traditional cloud infrastructure because they don't have, I mean, they don't have things that move around. Uh, geography is not a problem, IO is not a problem. So FogOS addresses these kind of issues, and besides it, it's really designed to really um, be able to run in highly heterogeneous and resource constrained nodes, nodes. So we can manage things that are up to microcontrollers, and I'll explain how we do that, okay? Yeah, so let me actually go real quickly. In terms of architecture, there are two main layers. The FIM, which sometimes it's called also VIM in other domain. So the virtual infrastructure manager, which is what we call the fog infrastructure manager, and the force, okay? What is the force? Let's start top down. The force essentially is our uh, provisioning engine, okay? Typically, it consumes manifests that are defined by the user uh, computes the feasibility of allocation, tries to figure out the optimal allocation, and then monitors the invariance requested by the application and adapts the deployment of the application on available resources to ensure the, the constraint. The constraint could be, again, spatial, geographical, or the, in the example I gave with the robots and the brain, uh, they, are, they have to be reevaluated continuously because there is a spatial constraint imposed over them, which is a distance, geographical distance. Um, we have done lots of work on the FIM. The force that we have currently, it's a little bit, I would argue, primitive. That's where we're putting now most of the innovations. But uh, the, um, uh, the allocation policy that we have is a first fit. You know, this is a NPR the, um, scheduling problem. Uh, and right now we have a greedy solution that the first, solu the first allocation that matches the constraint of your application um, and matches the resources available, we take it, okay? There is actually some randomization when you have multiple uh, solution possible, but uh, that's what we do. We are working actively to have uh, um, you know, uh, improved uh, uh, allocation, but this is what you get, and uh, that's, uh, in any case, if you're unhappy, it's a plugin, you can write your own. So that's the other important things. The theme, so the Fog Infrastructure Manager, is what provides you the virtualization for all the hardware resources. So it virtualizes CPU, it virtualizes storage, it virtualizes the networks, it virtualizes the I.O., okay? And it provides API uh, for managing uh, these resources. Okay, let me go actually. Uh, okay, so what is a resource in FogOS? A resource in FogOS is anything that can be assigned to an application either in an exclusive or on a shared manner. So computational resources are, are, as a, are an example, and we support also accelerator. In some cases, we have applications that require an FPGA or a GPU accelerator, so you can describe that. Uh, networking resources, as well as I.O., such as a COM, I, I2Square-C, or a GPIO. A FOG application node is anything that is running our agent. Okay, so in this example, you see that, for instance, we have agent running on the things, agent running on the edge infrastructure, and an agent running on the cloud that technically has our driver 
to the cloud infrastructure provided either by Amazon, by um, Google, or by whomever is running that infrastructure. So that uh, uh, you are not forced to, uh, to use uh, FogOS in the cloud, but any uh, application that, do, that you submit uh, on FogOS will be able to leverage cloud resources and uh, pilot your YAS infrastructure uh, provided by the cloud vendor. Okay, so we don't want to replace cloud vendors. Uh, we want to integrate with them, but at the same time, allow you to, to manage and monitor everything in, uh, in a uniform manner. Um, FogOS is capable of creating end-to-end -end networks. I'll, I'll take two minutes, maybe more, and I, I want to show you we do that. But in general, okay, we are able to create level two overlay, end-to-end. -end. Uh, I'll explain how we do it, but that allows us to create arbitrary network that connect a security application from potentially a device that is here up to something that is up there. Now, these overlay are tunneled over Xeno. And this is why we can make it, because imagine all of a sudden you have something here that is running over Bluetooth, and then we are going up um, through an IP connection. Um, if you want to do, uh, sorry, well, uh, if you want to do a level two tunneling, how do you do? So in brief, we create a virtual interface here, okay, that actually doesn't exist, and then we tunnel the traffic over Xeno, over Bluetooth, okay? And we do that completely transparently for you does the need for, for Zeno. Um, our manifest look a little bit like this, and by the way, they are a superset of Etsy, NAV, and MEC information models. Why? Because they allow you to express also accelerator and I.O. Let's get to the architecture real quickly, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. So you see that in terms of the architecture, at the bottom we have Zeno, and Zeno can run on top of the data link. So that's essential for us, because IP doesn't, doesn't work everywhere. At the same time, we need a uniform communication plane that uh, connect us from the device to the cloud. Then we have YAX that, by the way, leverages the Xeno protocol. And then FogOS is just an agent, which is um, uh, the manager of a node and a set of plugins that are used to manage networks, hypervisors, uh, I.O., and so on and so forth. Okay. The state management and distribution is done through YAX. So essentially, the logic is that every node maintain its state. And uh, any provisioning action uh, as through YAX, while data is maintained locally, I can access data globally, can access any slice of data potentially from anywhere. But the data re relative to a node is maintained uh, locally. So we don't need uh, to distribute data in a use uh, useless manner, OK? And the other point is that if you're trying to build a fog infrastructure, um, if you don't have the ability to store the data locally, uh, where do you store it? Actually, you have no clue, right? There is not necessarily a good point where to store it. Um, so the ability of storing data locally and access it globally, it's, it's essential. Uh, we use a very interesting pattern to avoid concurrency or bad concurrency. So all the state is divided into public and private and actual and desired, okay? Uh, the agent, is the only one that can change the actual state. So as there is only one agent per node that manages resources, it's only the agent that can change the actual state of a given, of allocation of a given set of resources. Anybody can change the desired state. This is like a control loop. And it's then the agent that decides where to converge. Okay, public and private state is used because some of the state is visible by all machine, some other state is, the, is only accessible uh, and shared between an agent and its plugins. So here there is a, a diagram that shows essentially how, through Xeno, we, we are able to create this, this network that uh, glues together all the resources, and now actually through Xeno, we are able to do um, uh, distributed virtual switching and level, level two tunneling, okay? I, I don't have much time to go in the details, but uh, there are, uh, the, the slides will be there. Okay, with respect to deployments, okay, so if we start bottom up, the smallest footprint that we have, okay, is essentially, uh, or let's do it the other way. If you take this uh, STM32 nuclear board uh, and you build an embed image starting from the embed OS example with Wi Fi, okay, uh, the uh, image without, let's say, our FogOS plugin is 56 kilobytes. 
And if you add the Fog OS plugin, is uh, 58 kilobyte. So essentially, the provision, all we need to provision um, a board of this type is two kilobyte. Okay? So the overhead is fairly minimal. Uh, if you want to have, but in that case, we don't have an agent, we just have plugins that communicate through JED agents through uh, YAKS. That's, that shouldn't be a surprise. Um, if you look at the Linux image that has uh, the agent and the plugin, is 30 megabyte. Uh, an a, a deployment, again, on ARM with the agent, um, the application, so YAX, the application, the plugin, is 45 megabyte. And if you have the full infrastructure, so you are, at, let's say, super node, then the, the footprint is only 57 megabyte. If you compare this to um, uh, Kubernetes, which is probably 700 megabyte, I mean, there is a little bit of a difference in terms of the, the overhead. Okay, I'll conclude with adoption. So as of today, FogOS um, is part, official part of the Etsy MEC platform. So we have received the, the stamp, the, the, you know, the rubber mark or the rubber stamp from Etsy, and you can actually download the, um, the connector through Etsy Man or from the Etsy website. Um, we were recognized as part of the 5G PPP initiative as the one uh, FOG and MEC platform available. By the way, it's, it's an open source project as part of Eclipse. Uh, open FOG Consortium is using FOGOS in quite a few test beds. And if you look at the applications that are leveraging FOGOS, there are lots of applications in uh, um, video uh, processing at the edge, okay, or uh, let's say distributed video processing, robotics. Uh, so as you know, ROS2 is quite popular in robotics, and we can provision and manage also ROS2-based robots. So that's something for which we have had uh, quite, a few, uh, quite a few applications. Okay, I think I'll, uh, I'll conclude there because then I had some slides on internals. Um, yeah. Are there any questions? Is it clearer what is for computing now? A bit, okay. <laughs> yes. It's talking about uh, folk uh, agents. Uh, as I understand correctly, it requires installing Fog OS. Uh, uh, oh, to totally separate. Uh, sorry, can, can you? Uh, so Fog OS. Okay, hold on, hold on. Yeah, so Fog OS. Yeah, so, so I should be more precise. It's not really. We call it OS, but it's not really an OS. So it can run. It's an OS in the sense wow. that you have an OS. Okay, it's more complicated than this. So, so sorry. Let me go back. We can run on Linux. We can run on Windows. And we can run without any operating system. Uh, so I saw uh, we can install uh, for, uh, for agents on the ARM devices, correct? Correct. So let me go for, back to that slide. Uh, so in this case, there is no, uh, there is ARM, um, yeah. there is an um, embed, but potentially, if you, uh, we could run on this without any OS. I see. Okay. Um, because in this case, we don't install the agent. The only things that we install is the plugins. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, the agent will see this board as an extension of its node, okay? Um, and the only things that the plugin has to do has to know how to manage the hardware, uh, so in that case, the STM, uh, and so that will be done by the, the plugin, and communicate with the agent through YAKS, okay? So that's, that's what happens. So for example, if I want to install Fog uh, agent on some lightweight ARM devices for, for example, some uh, home router, for example. Is uh -huh. it possible? Sorry, which device? The? Ho home router, for example, which runs some uh, Linux oh, yes. on ARM. I mean, on Raspberry Pi, you can so run, it runs run the full as stack. just a separate package? Yes, and in fact, if you want to, if you want to have any try, uh, here are some resources. So you go to Fog, Fog uh, where is it? Yeah, FogWest.io, oops. So that's the FogOS website, and it's an Eclipse, so it's an open source, open source project. So you have, uh, I'm not connected to the internet. But anyway, if you go under uh, FogOS, uh, and then, uh, yeah, here we go. So it's a, you, you know the Eclipse IoT, yeah. So it's an Eclipse IoT project, it has been an Eclipse IoT project for some time, and uh, you can check it out there. Um, and okay. have a try. Thank you, I'll check it out. Okay. My pleasure. Okay, we are over. Thank you very much.